Anybody need copies of minutes or agendas? Nope, I do not. Okay. Greetings. Is, are we recording? We are. Okay. It is 6.01, and this is the Enfield Master Planning Task Force. Hi, Bridget. Uh, it is September 27th, 2021. This is our last meeting of the year we are in the dpw conference room and also um, on zoom although i don't think we have anybody oh we have phil hi phil hi david so uh we'll call the meeting to order and go around the table and on to zoom for attendance on my left, Hanger Tully, David Frack, Billy Offiero, Brad Rift, Bridget Labrie, Bill, Bill Vermeer, and our staff people are Rob Taylor and Whitney Banker. Um, next is agenda review. Does anyone have any changes, corrections, or additions? Okay, hearing none, we'll go on to the minutes uh, from December 13th. Anybody have anything to say about the minutes? I have a couple of questions. I have just a little. All right, let, let's take Sealy first. All right, uh, 91. Um, the last sentence written document has a consistent packet format and tone. Yeah. Like it has that. Oh, as uh, the task force, which is what yeah, right. it should be. And then uh, one other one. Yeah. <coughs> it seems like these things don't get started. We go right over. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 232. Yeah. Just uh, the supporting document documentation for grant instead of grand. The grand would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Like Bridget, are you done, Celie? I'm done. Okay, Bridget, go ahead with your comments. Uh, Celie had one of them. The other one was 167. Um, it was, um, <clears throat> I think it should be whether it comes across unwelcoming the change in the community. <laughs> Right. Yep. Okay. Anything else? Okay, I had a comment. Um, not sure. Okay, this is line 44. If I said $4,320 was not accounted for, I grossly misspoke. Um, in my mind, not accounted for means we don't know where it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think what I had intended to say was that this is money that was not spent. <clears throat> um, line 48, it should be Ms. Jones would be doing website maintenance. Mm -hmm. And I believe those are my only issues. Anyone else have any comments on uh, on the minutes? Um, I would just clarify what you said about. So um, I didn't understand it. Four 
3.20 is not accounted for, meaning it hasn't been spent. Means it has it hasn't been spent. Okay. And uh -huh. not that it's been lost. It hasn't been lost. Okay. It's not in my pocket. So the next <laughs> sentence reads: There are four thousand, you know, three hundred and twenty dollars not spent instead of not accounted for. Uh, I, I, I think that would make more sense. That would make more sense. Yes. How about expended has not been expended? I, even better. Thank you, Sealy. <laughs> Uh, let's see. All right, co chair reports. Um, I have basically nothing to report. Um, Rob, can you fill me and the rest of the group in on? whether the purchase order thing to Barb went through, it, it did. Yes. Okay. The, the, so the, the that, balance in our, in our fund has been encumbered for 2022. Okay, so the 4320 figure that we just spoke about yes. is still available to the master planning task force. That is great news. But important to note, it will only be available in 2022. You right. can't cover it again. Right. I ran into that a couple of years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Only once. Yeah. Okay. Do um, you need a motion for the minutes? Uh, I would love a motion to accept the minutes. <laughs> I make a motion to accept the minutes as correct. Second. Motion made by Seeley, seconded by Re by Brad. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 I must abstain. Abstain. I choose to abstain. I should. Abstain. Okay, so Bill, you abstained as well. Abstain. Yes. Yuri, you abstain. Abstain. Okay. Two abstentions and four eyes. Is that enough to approve? You have to have a you have to have a quorum to approve minutes. I'm not sure. I well, yeah. So I was actually kind of sitting here. Um, We're a town committee, right? Task force. Task. Do we count as a? We've got a quorum. But we've got a quorum. We didn't get a quorum for the approval of the minutes. Yeah, that's true. Typically, no motion carries without. One. It, is it a quorum of those in attendance or a quorum of the uh, entire board? Let's, let's go with it, but I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out. Let's, let's go with it and we'll research the law at another time. We need to uh, make another motion some other time. We can. So, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, new business. Um, we have a review of the first draft of transportation, uh, review of available results from the community survey. And both of those are items that Brandy will be leading the discussion on. So Brandy, you can pick whichever one you want to address first. But I Great, I'd like, yeah, okay. I'd like to start with the survey results. Before you go any further, Brandy, so Rob, mm -hmm. was the chapter you sent out on transportation a replication of what David sent out on Thursday? I think so. Yes. Okay. yes. So there wasn't any difference in there. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Brandy. Yep. Yes, I, uh, I I barely squeaked getting the stuff out to you before the Christmas holiday began, and I I, I don't I don't think I quite made uh, Rob's deadline. <laughs> so um, I, David also fun. sent it along. Um, so I did want to start. I have been working on compiling the results from the community survey. Um, I've only gotten the vision section and the transportation section um nicely laid out but um i expect to have those other pieces over to you um uh, probably before we meet again um with the remainder of the results but i did get the um sort of analysis of who took the survey done and i think it's worth pausing mm -hmm. here at the at this point to just go over that um so that's <clears throat> if you have the um printed copy in front of you. 
um, that's on the first page that uh, of the partial survey results in the gray box where it sort of gives a breakdown of, of who you heard from in the survey. Um, and I think you'll remember as the survey was ongoing, I mentioned that you were not hearing from uh, renters and you did not um, through the end of the survey. So that's probably one of the more significant um, missing uh, demographic groups um, from your survey results. Um, so you heard from very few um, people who are renting in Enfield. The survey, the, the Census Bureau seems to think you have a have a fairly high number, you know, I would say a high number for a, a rural community of about 35% of households renting. Um, that might not be completely um, accurate, but what it does say is that there's certainly more than the 8% of the survey respondents, you know, that number, those two numbers are, are too far apart to to suggest that you, you got a, a representative sample of um, renters so that's that's something to 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 be aware of as we, we as we look at the survey results and go forward it probably will become something that's of particular interest when we're thinking about the housing responses um, to the survey and you know otherwise i would say the survey responses demographically broke down in a way that's fairly common you, you typically do get higher response rates from people who've been in town longer um, and from from older residents than you do from younger residents, so that's not um, unusual. So, did anyone have comments or questions on that part of the survey, sort of the who took the survey questions? Okay, not hearing any. I will move on. So. Um, I don't know that there's necessarily a need to walk through the survey um, responses um, so far one by one, um, but I, I think it lines up pretty well with what you were hearing from people um, in the other um, outreach venues that you have been um, using over the past year. Um, you know, generally, people are are fairly satisfied with um, things in Enfield, um, even with the condition of roads. So, you know, I guess it hadn't started to snow by the time people took the survey. <laughs> so your 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 uh, road uh, and highway department should be pleased. They often come out uh, really badly in these community surveys because there's always people who are griping about their roads. Um, but that actually people were pretty pretty positive there um people are generally satisfied with with um the community um and you see the sort of main tensions coming up in that people do want to see positive change but are very concerned about a cost of living and affordability going forward so those are just the, the competing um issues that are expressed through the survey that that show up um yeah we want to see things get better but we don't know how you're going to we can pay for it Randy, um, yes can i ask a question on the first page just below that little pie chart with better things mm -hmm. the second paragraph below that there's a line i don't i don't quite understand it says nearly 80 percent of respondents did not want the town to stay mostly the same and then it goes on to talk about um that they don't want Enfield to become more developed or what I was kind of confused the way that came across was it they didn't want yes to, because it they did yeah. want the town to say mostly the same or they did not want the town I, I, I was just confused by that yeah I, I can work on the wording of that perhaps it is a bit confusing what I did was I inverted the answer to the um actual survey question so if you look at the bar chart under what would you like Enfield, what would you like Enfield to be like 20 years from now? And you look at the bottom two responses. So 22% of people said they wanted it to be the same as it is now. So that really means that, you know, the other 78% are open to it changing in some manner <laughs> from how it is um, right now. Um, but then um, <clears throat> only 9% only wanted to see more um 
more growth, you know, it becoming a more developed community and less rural, which means, of course, the inverse on that one, that 91% don't want to see that loss of rural character piece. Um, and you can see that, you know, depending on which way you ask that question, the way that question was worded, you know, it definitely sounded like it was a very pro growth statement and that did not garner very much um, support at all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll work on that. Try to make that read a little better. Writing myself a note, sorry. Um, so um, I've also done run through and did a, a word cloud. So this is um, in the next page spread. So the pages three and uh, four of the survey. So that um, that question about what do you think the most important um, issue or pressing need is. That was an open-ended question. So this is a rundown of the um, words that came up the most frequently um, in those responses. And then I have summarized um, sort of the three top themes that appeared in that. And I will at some point uh, send you over just the outright export of all of the comments if you want to read through them. So you had 246 comments and obviously there's um, many um, of those that are very specific to an individual issue or something like that that may be of interest to you but i was trying to capture for the purposes of the report the um the primary themes that uh, a larger number of people shared um, and so those those came down um, to that idea of the, the cost of living a lot of the written comments um, spoke to to property taxes um, to water sewer rates and to to being able to afford to continue to live in the, the community going forward. So that was a, a really um, got significantly more written comments. So lots of people also their comments reflect several ideas. Um, so so somebody might have had that um, concern expressed and then also expressed some other um, ideas as well. So. And then the piece, and this this ties in interestingly to the um, economic development piece that we talked about last um, time we met, um, the downtown revitalization um, piece, obviously something that there is a significant um, support for and for is important to to many people. And then that preservation of rural character concept, one of the things that often that came up with this and is actually not uncommon either is that that means very different things to different people um and it's, so it's interesting to read through the comments to get a sense of the range of what people mean by rural character um for some people it's it's a very visual um thing that they basically don't want to see any thing change you know around where they live or on their drive um, you know, they don't want to see new buildings. They want to, to maintain whatever views over um, fairly natural terrain that they've got. Um, so it's, it's a very visual question. Other people think about it much more from a, um, an activity kind of point of view, that they want to still be able to engage in what, in, in rural life. So outdoor um, activities, hunting, um, trails, whatever their, um, whatever it is they enjoy doing um, in a rural setting. And, and so for them, that's very much the focus is that they don't want to see changes that would disrupt, um, disrupt those activities or reduce the amount of land available um, for them to enjoy those activities on. Um, and then for some people, it's, it's, you know, the environmental focus that you know, ha habitat or water quality, something like that, or um, so resource-based uses, so farming, forestry, that type of thing. People um, link the idea of rural character to land, um, having those kind of values for either working, working it in some way or as a conservation um, resource. So. That's that's one of the things that's interesting to see in those those written 
um, comments as well. And then the last two pages break down the response to the transportation specific questions. Um, and, you know, the one thing that comes out in here is that the idea of sidewalk, of being more walkable, um, you know, sidewalks, crosswalks, paths, that type of thing is the one thing that you've, you've sort of got majority support for um, in survey respondents. Um, the other things have, not to say they don't have uh, people who strongly would advocate for them, but they don't have the same uh, numbers of, of people um, focused on them. And, you know, generally, like I said earlier, the overall sense is that people are, are, are reasonably satisfied with the existing system, which once again isn't to say that there aren't people who have a very specific thing that they're very concerned about. Um, I know that when you had your some of your other outreach meetings, you got more impact, you know, more feedback on um, various intersections and things like that. But yeah, across Brandy, the survey, this is, this is Brad. Mm -hmm. on, on many respects, we get very strong opinions through the focus groups and things like that on some of these things, whereas the larger, however many respondents, uh, really did not put the issues as strong as the people that we were talking to. It was, uh, it was one of those the big differences that I noticed. Yeah, and I think what, what you're you're seeing is a somewhat broader um, group who responded to the survey. Um, yeah. And then, you know, sort of the act of having a conversation maybe causes people to focus in on issues of concern to them in a little more detail than they might get to in the survey. And like I said, if once you see the the more detailed written comments, you will see that people do have, you know, something quite specific um, that they may speak about in the comments. But you know, it actually takes uh, a fair amount of dissatisfaction, I think, for somebody to actually circle the dissatisfied uh, or check the dissatisfied box on a general survey like this. I think yeah. people are thinking fairly broadly when they look look through these um these options and um you know overall you know there was i remember seeing at least one comment in there where someone you know pointed out that you know that overall there really isn't traffic congestion in um enfield as compared to a, a more urban setting where you know there may be issues you know that could be improved but it's not it's not sort of comparable so it's also sort of what people's frame is for deciding whether they think something is a problem um, or not that they'll express on the survey. So, but yes, yeah, you, I think you got more specific um, focused comments, particularly around the intersection questions than you got out yeah. of the, the survey results. Yeah, yeah the, the, the route for um, Maple Street, it was uh, almost rabid responses from everybody that we talked to about that. And we were also on calls with uh, the Upper Valley uh, Planning Commission and the same type of thing. I mean, it doesn't matter really what we say, uh, what we get from the, the survey, because that's going to be dealt with anyways uh, through the uh, Lake Sunapee, you know, regional planning thing mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. as it's a state yeah. road. So it'll get dealt with one way or the other. Um, interesting, though. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Um, in regards to the um, Maple and Maine survey, um, Brad just mentioned that it's going to be dealt with by the state, which I believe is accurate. Yeah. And therefore, it's going to be state tax dollars and not town tax dollars. And I wonder if you should make that distinction in the um, in, in the way you title this bar chart. Well, this is the um, this is the question that you actually asked on the survey. So this is how the question was worded on the survey itself that people responded to. But maybe in the text somewhere we talk about 
some of these things yeah. that were yeah. a concern to some people are going to be handled, especially the the Maple Street. That's like what three or four years away, Rob. I think. Yeah, and and then the uh, other um, some of the other issues uh, is um, uh, Route Four A repaving and widening and all that sort of stuff is you know six to ten years down the pike type of deal. Mm -hmm. And my, my other, again, this goes back to the fact that I don't remember the specifics of the question. Uh, for sidewalks, my recollection is that uh, we were all very surprised yes. that people wanted sidewalks from the Main Street Bridge up for a out to, I think, the, the Shaker Museum or the Shaker mm -hmm. Field. And I, again, you know, if, if the question was asked along Route 4A along the lake, then that's probably the way it should be. But there, there might need to be some clarification um, that most people seem to want, you know, where exactly along Route 4A most people would yeah. like to see sidewalks. I don't recall saying the words along the lake. Did we actually have that in the question, Brandy? So the question had that list that you see in the bar chart under do you support the town building new sidewalks? That was the list. And I think I will double check, but I'm pretty sure that was how they were worded. And it was an other category, and so we did. You did get a few um, written responses, um, particularly with people being a little more descriptive about um, Enfield Center, um, and and a few other places where they felt that traffic um, was a concern. So some people had, you know, they'd like to see a sidewalk between this business and that business, and either along four or four A. So you'll see in the written comments a, a little bit more depth there. Yeah. Okay. People. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, you know, again, I think that that the, the the tension, I guess, between improving and maintaining, um, so keeping what we have and staying within our means versus fixing problems that we recognize are here or things that we'd like to have differently or better. Um, is shows up in in these transportation questions as well, um, which uh, particularly I think when you read through the comments um, in more detail you'll get that that flavor coming through. So that's I think that's a, a, a definitely a, a key theme from from these um, from the responses. And then um, the commuting data was was interesting. Uh, first of all, the sort of the surprising um, statistic was that a very large percentage of the people who responded to your survey um, aren't uh, commuting. So um, some of that speaks to the age breakdown of, of who we heard from. We heard from a lot of retired people. Um, and um, so of those people who did reply, so we only had 133 people who answered the survey who were um, indicated a regular commute. Um, none of them were commuting via transit and uh, only a handful carpooled, walked or biked. So almost everyone was driving uh, themselves to work. Um, and then we asked those people who said that they did drive alone to work um, some follow-up questions. and. Only the people who took the survey online got these. The people who took who did, who responded with a paper survey, which wasn't a huge percentage of them. So we only we had, I think, maybe about twelve or so paper surveys. Those people didn't um, didn't have access to these questions, but the rest of the survey um, takers did. Um, so for those people who who did say they were driving alone. There's not a lot in that list um, that uh, would cause people to change their behavior. And I thought it was interesting that uh, the thing that was the least likely to cause people to change behavior was basically the cost of commute, of driving, right? So vehicle fuel costs, um, which I think really points to um, one of the, the challenges of, of, of altering commuter behavior, if that's your um, goal, is that it's it's still from a convenience and affordability factor, um, obviously 
you know, works for the large majority of people. Um, the thing that seemed like it would be most likely to change some people's commuting behavior um, was the safe route to, to walk a bike that was separated um, from traffic, um, which is, you know, you, you've got a bit of in the, in the rail trail, but, um, you know, the winter conditions obviously make that not viable um, year round as an option for a lot of people. Um, and, and it raises a really important question about sort of needing to um, duplicate the vehicular transportation system in a way that would work for non-vehicular um, travel if you were really um, going to be more serious about altering um, that driving behavior. So that's what I've got on the survey so far. So next time, hopefully we'll have some more sections here to dive through and actually I hope to get them out completely, but. So anything further people wanna say on the survey? It comes to my mind, Brandy, this is Rob. Uh, uh, the whole idea of uh, not a very good uh, participation from renters in the uh, in the responses to the survey it comes to my mind that that may be one of our future focus groups to, to sort of see if we can try to pin some of them down to get them in here and have a little chat with them you know the, the 15 or 20 of them in this room maybe or however we go about that might be uh might be productive to try to get some of their feedback i think you're probably going to reach them in a way that we didn't necessarily go about, which is kind of that door to door approach. I mean, who knows if they're on or even know about the listserv and some of those pieces, you know, they they may not be thinking that long term or they're just not that involved to know that this is something or the importance of, I still think the understanding importance of a master plan is still lacking for a, a lot and they just don't don't know why they'd spend the time so and i think that's just going to take time to build and they're going to have to see what it is and what it brings to the table and hopefully the next one will be stronger but i, I mean depending on how things go if we kind of know some of those rental properties that might be a way to approach that is having a session and specifically going and asking or maybe we can can we hang things on doors? We, have to, we can do that, right? <laughs> do we have a way to count to know how many rental units there are in Enfield? Just what I think Brandy was referring to. It's in the <clears throat> census. Oh, it's in the census. Yeah. So the well, accuracy the of the census is <laughs> is somewhat questionable, but you know, it certainly indicates you have a fairly um, significant um, base of, of rental housing. And a lot of it's gonna be rental single family homes, um, I would assume. So um, it's not easily distinguishable <laughs> necessarily from the non-rental housing stock. Um, and I, I have found too doing um, planning projects over the years that it, it's very often necessary to make a special invite um, to renters who I think often get a message that, you know, town government isn't really for them um, or, or, or doing anything that's of, uh, that, that they're not really looking for, for their participation because they're not taxpayers um, directly. Of course, they are very much indirectly taxpayers. Um, and, and so I think just, you know, being more inviting and welcoming can often um, in, get some some folks to to participate so if there's nothing else on the survey we can switch over to looking at the transportation um, section and for that I'm gonna actually probably work mostly off the just the plain text version rather than the fancy uh, 
layout version because my uh, notes uh, for discussion are in that um, text version and are not necessarily in the layout version. Um, so just as a point to start with, um, there's a few sections at the end that still need to be filled in and the notes do indicate that, but so we've got the opening um, pieces with the basic inventory um, in here. Um, from a municipal point of view, you know, roads and transportation is a lot of what the municipality does. It's a big chunk of your function um, as a town government. And so the extent to which you want the comprehensive plan to um, have a focus on those things that are within the purview of town government. I think we had this conversation many, many months ago when you were, when we were, you were looking to, to hire a consultant and you had looked at the Berlin town plan. Um, and, and that's one of the things about the Berlin town plan is that it's very much focused on what is within the purview of town government. And so um, that is something to sort of think about how you want that to, to fit in here. And the transportation section is, is a big piece where um, the maintenance of your roads is within entirely within your purview and nearly entirely on your checkbook. Um, so you, it's, a, it's something that you can have a lot to say about. I think one of the things that will make it more clear is that when we get the inventory update from, from your brother, Rob, uh, there's there's a lot of roads, obviously, in town that are state, right? So more than you think. You, you've got Route 4 and 4A and then uh, Shaker Hill, of course. And so it, it's more than people think, and, and those are controlled budget-wise by the state, right? So even though our large percent of our budget is dedicated to uh, road maintenance, um, it could be a lot higher. <laughs> Yeah, so so this inventory section is sort of worked its way through the uh, road hierarchy, um, starting with um, the interstate is fairly brief on that. Um, and then speaks to 4 and 4A um, in more detail, but trying to get to a focus of how those roadways um, intersect with your land use and your um, economic development and housing needs. So really, you know, less focused on the condition of the pavement perhaps, and um, more focused on how the highway functions in your, and either contributes or doesn't contribute to the, um, the other goals that you have for the community. And I know you're fairly happy with the um, the regional um, corridor transportation plan, and that has some fairly specific recommendations in it. So one of the things you can basically do is just sort of suck that in by reference, and and go with go with that um, as a reference document in your your plan. So is there anything on the four four A section that people wanted to talk about? Um, Brandy, it's David. Mm -hmm. And I have just a suggestion to give a little bit of a tip of the hat to the historians that will be looking at this. Could we say Route 4A, a state highway, originally New Hampshire Turnpike Number 4 or whatever it was? Is that something that you think would be a good thing to Why not? To add in? We can do that. I think it's Fourth New Hampshire Turnpike officially. But I will double. look that up. Okay. <clears throat> also, Brandy, on the second paragraph in the section mm -hmm. on Routes Four and Four A, uh, didn't capitalize the A on Four A. This is the first. Oh, section. I missed one. Okay. Very good. Just to be consistent. Yep. I did have one thing on that second paragraph, the historically our roads 
were developed, which I'm sure you'll catch this when you're reading it through. But I don't think it's our roads developed in response. I think it's were developed in response to the terrain. Uh, I'd be able to read it either way. Well, I debated that. I guess I wasn't sure. Really. Okay. Yep. Uh, um, I did have a question. We talked. So when we get into the numbers on the uh, vehicles, so kind of under the section routes four and four A, mm -hmm. uh, the third paragraph, yeah. you were talking about traffic levels on route four A were lower, and it talks about the um, vehicles per day in Enfield Center. Do we know, or is there information on the other side, like by the Lebanon line? Because I feel like Enfield Center is there is a counter. Okay. There is a counter um, on the other side. I don't think the counter is in Enfield, but um, yeah. there is one. I can pull those numbers up if if you want to look at that closer to the four. I think there is one closer to the four this intersection with four. Yeah. Where did you pull that uh, those numbers from, Brandon? So those come um, right from the state. The state has a um, an online um, based data viewer where you um, can can click on their road map, and after you cursed at it enough, you can get the answer. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very yeah. it's a very grumpy interface. It's actually interesting. I don't know who the software provider is that provided this, but it obviously came through US Highway because other states have the same one. And mm -hmm. it, it's something apparently only a traffic engineer can love. Um, the only reason I asked was just because I live maybe a mile from Enfield Center, but I drive the other direction on Foray every day, potentially twice a day. So I'm just wondering like, what about all of the people that are headed, basically that work in, in lab. I'm just curious if the numbers are the same or different, because I rarely so, go the other direction. Because you're saying that there's a lot of traffic that would feed in from Crystal Lake and Shaker Road. Yeah, and what? Shaker Hill Road. And I rarely would head the direction of Enfield Center unless Im going to Proctor's, which- Yeah, which is often, right? Which, For a sandwich. It's not as often because I don't, I'm working in lab yeah. most yeah. of my week, so. You know, maybe I go there once a week if there. I'm just curious what the numbers are. Does that change things? Does it make it? Any... Yeah, the, I I think you'll see. I mean, the numbers will be higher at that end because it is a it is collecting. It, you know, that's what yeah. it is. It's a collector street and it's collecting um, traffic coming in. But you, I think the broad trend that there really hasn't been any any meaningful growth will probably still hold true. But um, I can pull those numbers and add them them in um as well because if there had been you'd, you'd see it on route four too and and you know there isn't that um there wasn't a real bump there either so um but that's something we can definitely look at yeah i was just thinking for comparison's sake like you said it might not be a big bump but i would just be curious <clears throat> there's a lot of traffic that goes down to concord that go to the it goes to the interstate going down that way by going over Four Corners Road, I know yep. that's the yeah. way I'll go. <clears throat> yeah, I instead recently. of going all the way up to seventeen. Yeah. Same, yeah. same. But I'm just thinking, you know, and it's talking about just kind of that average per day. That's I don't go to Concord daily either, you know. So you're yeah. going to catch those who maybe work that direction, but there's probably a majority is going to work the other direction. Yeah, so I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. The long way. I'm just curious what the number was. That's all. <clears throat> Yeah, so a few of those counters, I, and I don't know which one. So some counters are sort of continuous count counters. I don't know if any of those on 4 and 4A are the continuous count counters. Um, others come from the various traffic counts that the regional planning commissions do. Um, so you know when you see and you drive over the tubes across the road um, yeah. that that's part of one of those traffic counts. Um, and then there's a very complex uh mathematical formula that's that's done to take those actual counts and um, convert them over to what this average annual daily traffic number is which is meant to adjust for seasonal variation and things like that um, but so you get some combination of both 
continuous data points along the way and then these interim counts um, that they're using to create a mathematical model of exactly how much traffic there is out there. And, and that model has changed over time, which is one of the things that's a little bit weird about comparing the traffic counts over time. Um, you know, if you actually pull up the reports and look, I now have the table, which I might actually end up putting a table of traffic in here um, in the, the text, because um, I have the numbers at this point. The ones from the, you know, through the 1990s are all rounded off to like in 2000 increments. So, you know, their estimate was plus or minus 2000, um, basically. Um, whereas the current counts are um, are done out um, to more detail. I think that's probably because they have got more continuous counter data that they can um, feed into the system, get more detailed numbers. but. But yeah, so if you're curious about traffic numbers, you can find the, um, and I'm, I was just looking to see what the, exactly it is they call it, um, the, the, the app, the online app. And you can attempt to find the little, little dots on the map and see what the traffic levels have been at those over time. But you should store up a, some curse words in advance before you, before you start. So, yeah. So moving through the um, inventory piece. So we after we get through the, the sort of state highway system, we get down to the the town road system. Um, there, I'm assuming that you guys don't have any great plans to add new roads. Um, and uh, or to take no, roads, a, you obviously haven't been taking roads for a long time. There's a pretty decent um, inventory of uh, roads and uh, um, bridge replacement and things like that that uh, Jen has. Uh, I'm not sure you'd want to put it in this text, but it would be something you could link to maybe. Right. And Jim yes, has lots of stuff with Brandy. Oh, really? From the GIS standpoint. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we can we can go through. I know you sent some notes over about some other data that may exist. So we, there's still some need to go through here and sort of figure out what yeah. what is where um, in terms of inventory. Um, I mean, the things you'd want to mention in the plan in particular is if you've got some um, roads that you know need um, significant work or you have yeah. plans for or um, things like that, because if you are, you know, if, if the town is going to be looking yeah. to fund those projects going forward, it could be helpful to have it in the plan. Or yeah, that's the information those. that I'm referring to that uh, Jim has, because it's interesting. I mean, there's a plan on how he's going to spend money and, and what uh, roads he's going to improve. So I, yeah, I that, that, yeah, that that I assume is part of your capital improvement program, which I, I think at this point I have a piece of, but not the whole thing. So that's one of my notes down here is that I, I need to get access to the full set of, of documents that go along with the capital improvement plan. And, you know, really that's what I, kind of the point I was getting at at the beginning is that budgeting and maintaining the roads is actually a really big function of town government at this point. It's one of your biggest expenses. It's the sort of the core activity that people, um, residents and taxpayers expect for their money um, is that the roads are going, going to be maintained. Um, so that's, that's one of, of, of your core services. Um, <clears throat> I just want to bring up regarding the CIP and <clears throat> may, I just think that, uh, I don't know if everybody else thinks that, but has a CIP taken, include the planning and budgeting for road repairs and upgrades. I don't see that by the CIP program. I think it should be by the people that work here, the planning board. I mean, <coughs> it has to be something with, with that knows the town, what they're doing, and so on and so forth, and, and planning. But a CIP to me is, you know, that's a, that's a lot to have them sit there and tell you you need this road fixed here and that. And I don't see that, the, in that role. Go ahead, John. You're thinking, I know. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> See the smoke. 
What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got a, you got a, in this town, you got a pretty good staff of public works. So they generally, I think the CIP defers a lot. I, I would agree with what you're saying. I think that the CIP is more for uh, hard goods, uh, you know, dump trucks, graders, right. those kind yeah. of things. And so, so Rob, public works as, a, as a clarifying question then is, because I, I didn't exactly find the full CIP. Um, so are you saying that um, road improvements themselves are not actually in the capital improvement program? I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Jim in the morning. There may be some kind of a parallel program there that he's got. Okay. Yeah. I know that they try okay. to publish it. Is it uh, my recollection is published somewhere that they share that. I know we did in Plainfield where, you know, in the town report, it was like the last 20 years worth of road improvements. And the next 15 were sort of outlined as to so when people can expect to see their road get fixed, that kind of a thing is good to outline. I'm sure Jim has something like that, whether it's CIP based or whether it's a department. We also did, um, Randy, you may recall there was a there was a little movement afoot here maybe three or four years ago when our previous town manager was still sort of in his regime, uh, we did what we called strategic governance planning, mm -hmm. which was for each department head to come up with their own strategic plan. And I could share those with you as well. You could see what, because okay. that was sort of put on um, department heads to sort of figure mm -hmm. out what their priorities were gonna be for the next, I think the horizon was like five years maybe. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't- There may be some thing. useful, yeah, there may be some useful material in that that, that could get folded in here. Yep. 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 Okay. So I'm going to be doing some more um, mapping. Um, Jim sent me some of the um, older mapping that you've gotten. I think that was last updated in 2008. So there's got to be a little bit of going over and um, sprucing that up. Um, but one of the questions I had with regard to sidewalks was what your current town policy is. And one of the things that sparked this was actually a survey um, comment about the the town maintenance of the sidewalks at Enfield um, Center. So um, how is the town dealing with um, maintenance of public sidewalks in the winter? So we have a, a little tractor, it's a John Deere, and it has both a snow plow for it and a snow blower. And uh, when it snows hard, they send the guy, there's a guy that drives it. His first priority is he goes downtown to, in, in, you know, the regular village of Enfield, uh, you know, downtown. But he does eventually make it out to uh, Enfield Center to work some of those sidewalks. Unfortunately, that one, I think this Enfield Center sidewalk is just a single sort of stretch. So he sort of goes down and back on the same. Whereas in, in Enfield Village, he can go do a couple of loops. There's not a lot of sidewalks. So I think we only have right. maybe a mile and a half or so total. Yeah. And, um, um, yeah, that's really and then cool. if the sidewalks on the state highway, is the town maintaining the, the sidewalks on the state highway? Yes. Yep. So Main Street is actually a state road in, in Enfield. So all those sidewalks are maintained by the town. And uh, we have an agreement with the state. They're supposed to do summer maintenance on Shaker Hill Road and Main Street. And we do the winter maintenance. It's kind of a bum deal because they don't do anything in the summer <laughs> and we do everything in the winter and of course everything in the winter is really hinged on the quality of the work from the summer Maynard could tell you it's Maynard's house is actually on a state road and it's notorious for these drainage issues where the lack of good drainage causes water and then of course in the winter it causes ice and uh, so I would say that's less than ideal but uh, yeah, that little sidewalk system is not optimal because you know, a real system like the city of Lebanon would have, 
is like a half a million dollar machine. That little sidewalk rig oh, they've yeah. got, it's articulating. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little cat diesel inside of it. It's a pretty fancy little rig. Um, ours is kind of a homemade, well, sort of off the shelf consumer grade and it doesn't work that well. It's not, it's not awful. The sidewalk plows are notoriously unreliable. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the major complaints. Well, it's funny, um, the, the RPC has been trying to talk Jim into a sidewalk inventory, which is a service they provide. Mm -hmm. And Jim chuckles at it because we only have a, a mile and a half of sidewalk. They just did the same type of service for Claremont. Claremont has 35 miles of sidewalks in the city of Claremont. Mm -hmm. So you can see we don't necessarily need that sort of level of, of commitment in terms of our sidewalks. But I think certainly the, the community survey and I think everybody here recognize that it's something that people want and they want more of really. I mean, it would be neat to have more villages and neighborhoods mm -hmm. accessed by sidewalk. Well, I'll probably... give Jim some cleaned up GIS files of the sidewalks. That'll probably be enough of an inventory. Yeah. Um, I've, I've actually done those sidewalk uh, inventories for, yes. for a couple of communities myself. Um, but yeah, given the amount that you have, um, but it is, you know, just like with the roadway inventories, it's, it's good to keep track of um, the conditions over time so you can plan and schedule your needed maintenance. Absolutely. And, and, you know, even with a mile and a half, I think people's level of expectation is going up all the time. Mm -hmm. So the old way of doing things is less and less acceptable to a lot of people. And, well, uh, it's one of those really weird things of finding myself in New England. I'm, I grew up in New York and in New York, you property owners maintain the sidewalk. And if you don't maintain the sidewalk, the municipality comes around and does it and then bills you like crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you do it. Um, and, you know, the notion that that's apparently a notion that just causes absolute uproar in New England. I don't know. Um, I've, I've brought it up several times. which like, you can't do that. I'm like, well, legally, I think you can. But, you know, <laughs> apparently you think you would be tar and feathered and run out of town if you do it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so there's lots of different ways of handling, you know, these these questions. It's kind of an interesting point, but um, you know, the the notion um, I came across in doing research actually for the project I was working on in Brattleboro once. It's really interesting. Uh, you know, the the winter maintenance is always a conundrum. It's like who's going to do what in what order, and so I think it was out of um, it was either out of Denmark or the Netherlands, um, but it was a municipality that had um, set forth a contract to have the parking, the roads, and the walkways and paths, which they had a lot because you know they believe in bicycling, um, <laughs> to to be all winter maintained in the winter by different companies. And the rule was whoever got out there first could dump their snow into the other the other party's area so if the sidewalk pathway people got out there first to plow they could plow it into the road or whatever you know so it was really an order of operations thing that was uh, intended to create some competition to get out there so i thought that was an interesting uh, interesting approach so um moving on down through the inventory list um the class six town road piece, I think you've got pretty clear um, policies and um, inventory on that. And we can link to that. So that seems pretty, pretty basic. And then um, private roads, you had a couple of survey comments from people who uh, live on private roads who are not very happy about paying taxes and not getting road maintenance. Um, but that has obviously been a long-standing approach. You actually have a pretty significant amount of private road mileage um, because most of the stuff around the lake is on private roads. Um, but that's, um, I assume the policy you want to continue with. And so this is an opportunity to create some foundation in your plan for the policy that you've got in your regulations now. 
And I will say, Brandy, too, just to update you, and David could back this up. It's come up a lot recently at the planning board level. In fact, they are proposing some zoning amendments this year coming up. Start to change some of the definitions of what constitutes road frontage and how that's sort of uh, set up. It's become a little bit problematic recently. We've had people coming in with subdivisions trying to use uh, class six road for frontage or private road for frontage. And so that's certainly something that I think will have consequences how we how we sort of deal with it now through the natural planning process, eventually informing some real serious revisions to the zoning ordinance. Mm. So what's the broader um, sort of policy context on this? Is it an effort to sort of push into land that's difficult to access? Is that what's driving this or? It's a little bit of that. You know, there's been people with land uh, that has only class six frontage. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have a class six road policy in uh, as far as I could tell of the reading of it, and I know you've had some, I'm looking at Celie, she's had some issues with it. And it's very, it's different from, from my hometown. My hometown, there's a moratorium. No single family homes can be built on a class six road. But in Enfield, if you go to the select board and you get them to sort of buy into it, you're in business. And since I've been here, we've, we've done that three or four times. Two, three. At least three. Three. At least three. 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 Yeah. And so, I don't know. I think the planning board is pushing back a little bit on that from some of their experience. Uh, the whole idea of just being able to say, okay, there's no road front at all. I'll just make a private road. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we've had developers in town who've taken that a little too, I think, uh, to the negative side. There was a rule that you could. You could access up to two house house lots with a private road, and that got them out of having to meet any kind of design standards that the town has because our design standards kick in at three houses being accessed by the right. same road. Three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. Three or more. So we've had people coming in. These are lots that are still undeveloped that are serviced by these un unbuilt private roads and uh it's 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 a mess there's a couple of, of pieces of property where it's very messy it's sort of vintage infield so the these are really important points from a, a land use perspective and they'll tie into the housing conversation as well um you know in a lot of the house lots that were created, you know, 1980s and 1990s were pretty readily accessed from the existing road network. And a lot of that sort of existing easily accessible frontage land has been chopped up. Um, and so as you're looking forward at what kind of, of, of development you're going to see, you're going to see more difficult land coming forward that's got more challenging access. Um, either from just the sort of lack of frontage point of view or from needing to cross water bodies or slopes, um, you know, that there are constraining factors between the existing road network and where the development wants to occur that have to be dealt with. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that your, your regulatory system needs to be dealing with. And it's good for the plan to offer some solid foundation for whatever policy direction you think you want to head in with those things. And, you know, these are matters that do have fairly serious implications for the community, oftentimes not maybe immediate ones, but certainly over time, they definitely do. There's the question of um, emergency access um, to homes. Um, so that's one of the, you know, real concerns about allowing um, residential development to continue off along these fairly unimproved um, public road right of ways, so like the class six pieces, um, and where the, the town is not 
obligated to maintain them to to a standard is that you really are allowing people to to build in a place that you are acknowledging you can't access you might not be able to access readily with a fire truck um, and that that's got that's got some kind of serious problems that that go along with it um, so you have that side of a of, of set of concerns um, there's yeah. concerns mm -hmm. certainly when when these roads are built if there's not good road standards in place. One of the main ways that public roads are damaged when there's when there's a storm event and a flooding is that they're damaged by the private infrastructure that meets up with them. So the point of weakness is often that intersection of the public and private. And so a lot of public damage to public resources could be being done by private development that wasn't um, well constructed or engineered in the first instance. So that's a point of concern for the municipality. And then on the other side is the one related to housing and, and in a rural setting, how to allow for housing without having to completely overbuild infrastructure to a suburban standard. Um, so there's sort of these, as with much in planning, competing objectives and, and some tensions built into the system that really the plan is supposed to be supposed to help um, navigate. Uh, I want to add, Brandy, a lot of those roads were thrown up by the town, mostly because of probably water and um, or that, you know, the town could not maintain them because they'd fallen off and it, they're in the middle of a water drainage system and the roads get wiped out, but that's not going to maintain them or they, or they go through wetlands. And that's quite a few of ours that um, mm -hmm. are like that. So it's anything going in there would have to do a lot of work to, to bring it up and make it usable at all, really. So. Yeah, I, I once did a work for a town over in Vermont, Salisbury, where they uh, there was a 1960s era town truck still in the roadway. It had sunk. <laughs> it was buried. <laughs> they knew it was there. <laughs> they had never gotten it out. Um, that, that piece of road was discontinued as well. Um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, these are serious considerations. Usually the reason the town has is, is no longer maintaining that section of road is that, you know, the cost of doing so does not, uh, is not commensurate with the value you would get out of it, you know, in terms of the property you're accessing. Okay, so that might be a section we do a little bit more um, work on to try to beef that up because it does sound like it is a relevant um, issue for you. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Okay. So then we come to the, the last few sections here. I did not get a chance to finish writing these out, but these are, and they may not all be things that you think are relevant to keeping in. Um, so you obviously do have some, I have some map data on on trails and I can expand on this. I don't know if you have any other plans or studies or aware of them that have sort of been done by other entities that um, cover trails and Enfield, if there's anything there you want referenced um, in this section. Did you say trails? Yeah, trails. Trails, yeah, we're up to trails. I would definitely say the, you know, the, there's the, just the giant swath of conserved property in the middle of town that is uh, controlled by a few different entities. Probably the largest one would be the state of New Hampshire Fish and Game. Mm -hmm. and they control a very large chunk of land. It's thousands of acres. And it's interesting, we talked about this, I think at some point, yeah. one of the planning yeah. board or one of these meetings. And it was, it was coming up that People were getting mad seeing people out on the trails on in that in that part of the town with with guns, hunters, and the state kind of pushed back. The fishing game is like, well, that's why we have that land is to keep it open for hunters, and so they sort of are kind of coming around with this opinion that maybe it's not so great to develop it for sort of general recreational when we're trying to make it hunting yeah. ground. So there's a little bit of a competing interest there with regard to that specific uh, 
or those specific mm -hmm. properties if there's multiple fish and game parcels. Mm -hmm. And then the other one I would throw out there, Brandy, is the Upper Valley Land Trust has a very large chunk of land. I would say sort of in the center of the that uh, uh, section of town, uh, mm -hmm. very much surrounding uh, Smith Pond and accessing down to 4A and Smith Pond Road on the other side. And they are actually very much interested in developing it for its recreational benefits, meaning general trail access. And so there's some awesome hiking trails that I've actually checked out. I'm sure a lot of people yeah, here have. But they're great. Uh, you can hike from 4A. There's a there's a really great parking yep. uh, area with a trailhead and kiosk. And there's uh, historic shaker infrastructure you can see along those trails, uh, including locks and canals. Waterfalls. Waterfalls. Uh, Smith Pond itself was created as a penstock for their dam right. uh, infrastructure and their mills. So but yeah, definitely, definitely like throw the land trust in there as one of the sort of primary. And uh, I think they're involved with us a little bit too on some of our other town owned yeah. parcels, including the uh, Colette. Picknell Brook. Yeah. Picknell Brook. Yeah. Yes. I think the disappointing part of that is in some ways is that their structure seems to be only trails and that use. Yeah. And they're not open to other types of recreation. Yeah. Um, so I have small contention with that. To be. Yeah. They don't answer. So, because yeah. we were interested. Like Bicknell Brook? Uh, we were interested in the Smith Pond area uh, um, yeah. and the trail, because it's yeah. a great trail. Um, when we were looking for space for the disc golf, yeah. and that would lend uh, amazingly for that kind of activity uh -huh. um, with not a lot of change. Yeah, We'd have to put in the baskets, side. but it really wouldn't change yeah, the trails. Fields up there. And they, I could not get an answer from anybody. I but called multiple have, times. We did have, have success. success today. We had, we had success, yeah, last week, Wheelback. but it was announced. Yeah. And yep, yeah, Wheelback's going to do it. So this golf on the Wheelback Mountain. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it's going first in the Mascona Valley. And there is. See, Lee, there's also four society. Yes, um, mm -hmm. uh, they own all around north Crafton. of uh, in some Crystal place, and also out in Lock Haven Road. Yes, Heffern Reffer property. That's, that's what it. They call, yeah. Used to call it. Yeah, yeah. It's Brad, right. you must be familiar with that one. I'm actually, I know Grafton Farm, but I didn't know off of Lock Haven. I didn't realize. Yeah. We'll have to talk. <laughs> if there's a trail, I want to hike it. <laughs> That's what I got for you on that, but definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then, of course, the the sort of crown jewel of everything in, in town is the uh, Northern, Northern Rail Trail. Yeah, right. With, we have uh, a trail yeah. now. with State of New Hampshire uh, oversight there. That's uh, yeah. yeah the so I, I think it, yeah. I thought it would be good to add the trails piece in here since you don't have you know a recreation section necessarily a chapter planned at this point. So it's a good way to sort of reference that in obviously the rail trail has the ability to function not just as a recreational um, trail because of its connectivity. It you know, does have some other purposes. I don't know if you've got any other bits of trail that also we kind of can do trail. double duty. Yeah, we have a whole trail map and Kurt, I wish she was here tonight. I think her helped with that. He um, did the classics. Yeah, he did that too. Did so you give me that, Brandy? Did you get that uh, yeah. layer? The trails? Um, I do not have the trails. So I, I actually need to follow back up with you on the, the list. So Jim put a bunch of files on my computer on a, a disk and gave them to me. I wasn't quite sure exactly what was there. So now I've run through what's there. I need to follow back up and say, okay, I still need this one, this one, and this one. And we'll <laughs> yeah, there is there is a map that is at least in paper copy at the town office. And I'm hoping somebody has the electronic version of that because yeah. honestly it needs to get updated. But I think it's a layer on um, our GIS. I think there is a trails layer. There, there's, there's, it, there's, it, there's it shows up on the app. online GIS. So it must exist yeah. somewhere. So we just have to find the shape somewhere. file. Yeah. Yep. So and then we, we can update it too as part of this plan. So yes. that's that's doable. I, I know Jim has that because he gave it to me. 
and it's okay. on the Enfield Ashley's website. You could yep. pull it off. I think it's there. You could pull it off there if you'd like her. We don't have snowmobile trails, though. We have no map of that. And, and they are the they're through the town. Yeah. Yeah. They make them every year, and but uh, I mean, I think that's an interest, too, pretty big interest. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't don't they sell them to their members? They do. Right. So and there's a really good online resource for the snowmobiles. The snowmobiles, you know, there's the state. I mean, you when you register a snowmobile, you put the money in. They keep some of that money for you know marketing, promotion, trails, maps, and then they also give it back to clubs that are working locally to maintain trails and relationships and easements mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So I have seen all that stuff. It'd be interesting. I could talk to somebody in the snowmobile clubs. We've got a good relationship with them. See if that's readily available shape files and we can. Yeah, get. generally they don't like having their trail systems mapped as part of general trail systems because they're not open yeah. for general use. Yes. There's sort of there are membership based thing and they're also a, a use based thing. Actually, on the Heartland listserv today, there was a very stern warning that all of us without snowmobiles are to stay off the snowmobile trails. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's always that constant trail um, trail yeah. use uh, so. question. Yeah, but well, it but it's certainly something we can mention trail. in the text that those yeah. those those systems exist. Yeah. Funny, they don't. The Northern Rail Trail is definitely multi use so that we have yes. to share. That mm -hmm. one is available for cross country skiing and walking, horses, fat biking, and dog sledding. <laughs> that's cross. the coolest. Yep. When I'm out on a snowmobile, that's the coolest thing to see, if you ask me, is the, is the mushers. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. In Grantham, there's a couple of really competitive teams that are yeah. practicing. See them all the time out there. I would. Love the notation of people staying off snowmobile trails and also flip that to say stay off of our skating trails on the lake because yeah. it's not helpful when snowmobiles use a pre made trail. Yes. Yeah, it wrecks the ice. Yeah. I think we're coming up with good friendships. Yes. <laughs> I hope. But, you yeah. know, last year was the beginning. Last and no, year was and nobody knew what was going on. It's true. It's true. I think I'm excited. This year will be good. We got plans. Awesome. So the next thing on that list is whether you want to make any mention of boat access. It did come up in a couple of the survey comments, um, both from the point of view of you know accessing the water body for um, boat top type boat launch um, and also providing docking um, on the larger lake. Yeah, I, I certainly, I would support that. I think the, the public access to the lakes is important. Mm -hmm. We do have it, Mascoma, we have it pretty well covered with a, with a public beach. We've got a public boat ramp that the town maintains. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a secondary, um, what's called a non-motorized boat ramp at the Lakeside Park, which is for kayaks and canoes and uh, wind power, you know, sailboards, sailboats, things like that. And uh, the Crystal Lake does have a state-maintained boat ramp. Small. But I know I saw that too in some of the surveys that it was they were coming in. People were like, this should be a well, it's small and, yeah, it, and quite honestly, it, it's not very good. I mean, yes. there's rocks all over the place. Yes. You know, it's not it's not a very good boat ramp. Yeah. I saw somebody wanted a town beach on Crystal Lake. I saw that in some of the surveys too. Well, they could have one on Oliver Island. Just no way to get out. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the state yeah. owns, you have I think the state way. owns Oliver Island. It does. Uh, I wonder if the boat access piece might better go in the recreation section when we get to it just i think it. when when you get to it you could transition some of these pieces <laughs> over but if you don't i guess that was sort of my question as to whether you wanted to at least mention these under transportation 
given that you don't have immediate plans to do to have the recreation chapter it's sort of a how important is it to you <laughs> question yeah yeah I wouldn't I, devote I, a lot of, of, of I guess of, we should we should do it here, you know, thinking it through that um, we we should mention it because it belongs in the town plan. And I like Brandy's idea of transitioning it to the recreation center or recreation chapter when we get to that chapter. So my my feeling is let's put something in uh, as a tip of the hat to recreation interests in the town. Yeah, I mean, it, Brandy, it could be as simple as just stating sentences. what we have, right? Is that where you're thinking? Yeah. Like you're saying we Enfield has A, B, and C options with no immediate yeah, plan to create more. <laughs> Sorry, there's going to be a map. There's oh, going to be a map. Yeah. So one of the things that we can do is to put a bunch of the existing resources on the map, and that might be a lot of the, you know, uh, the bulk of the content um, at this point. But um, it, it, it probably, I don't think it hurts to to at least acknowledge other means of travel, even if it is around just around town and recreational as well. Um, here in the transportation section, so we can do that. So I did not get the public transit um, piece drafted. I've got the information necessary to do that for the most part, I think. I may need to do a little follow up with advanced transit around some current ridership numbers, but the, they have that information. So that's that'll get here. I just ran out of time and the week before the holidays ended up being a bad time. To I, I think it's people. important. We definitely mentioned that. And um, uh, certainly, uh, at least the vocal members that I spoke to and Eric spoke to, they want the service expanded, which would require a conversation with advanced transit and would probably require more commitment for funds from the town. But that, that may be something that we may or may not recommend. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brandy, just and as an FYI, I was going to just throw out the fact that Jim, Public Works guy, has been a longtime board member for Advanced Transit. So if you have any questions along okay. those lines, you could also ask him and tie it into other conversations if you, if you needed to. But Good. he's been on Good. their board for 15 plus years, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And then I think we do need to include something in here around parking. And I think this ties back also to the economic development chapter, because um, it would be primarily oriented around parking to for the downtown area and your, perhaps your recreation amenities. Um, so I didn't know if you had any sort of at least conceptual ideas or there have been some community discussions around addressing parking in the village i have, I have a statement for this i think we just say the town is aware of the need for additional parking period <laughs> <laughs> okay because okay. everybody talks about it and there are so many meetings about it and there aren't oh i mean there are, the there are conversations <laughs> happening and potentially, yes. I don't want to say immediately happening, but um, you know, we've discussed the Main Street piece. I don't know how far we are with that, but it's a real estate question. It's it does a, not mean real estate to do it. Yeah, I, I think I don't want to, I don't think we should probably say that we have immediate plans to address it as much as there. As you say, there have been millions of conversations yeah. and many, many meetings about the parking situation. It's a tough nut to crack because yeah. there's just not a lot of space to that you can <laughs> devote to parking. Right. Although some, some people have said <laughs> that Main Street was wider at some point in time and you had parking on both sides of the street. 
And maybe that's a possible solution. I mean, I don't know. Can we? Are we not in that history? Domain. I was, well, I was going to say, what are you going to take away? The sidewalk? Yeah. And that's, that's a whole other problem. I mean, you know, you know we're, we're not going to solve the world's problems yeah. in the next 35 minutes. No, no. Um, um, I, but I think we could, well, I mean, I'm kind of joking, but not joking about putting that, that sentence in there that, right. you know, the town. I mean, the town is aware yeah, of the need for additional. We're, we're aware of it, and, and there's you know, really... it, it could go under uh, weaknesses in, in the economic section, the development section. Maybe we follow it with, you know, conversations are happening to see what the options are for addressing the needs or something along that line. Okay, good. I can write something in that direction and then you guys can take a look at it. I just uh, wasn't sure sort of where that issue was in sort of the planning pipeline, whether you actually had looked at some some possibilities or anything like that. So yes, with that happy. information, I can advance. And I'm happy too, Brady, if you wanted to have a conversation, I could give you all kind. I mean, we wouldn't have to spend a lot of time at this meeting to get too deep into it. If you, mm -hmm. uh, if you, if you wanted more background, I could give you. Because I've been involved in like all now for four years or so in all the discussions, and certainly I can give you a lot of the history and some of the stuff that the town is working on. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that's been proposed. Some of the stopgap things that we put in place. You name it. We've got. Uh, okay. A lot there, and it's a lot to unpack. But I could certainly brief you on it if you wanted to. Check. Okay, we should plan to do that, and then I'll finish filling that in. Yep. Um, so that gets us through the inventory um, and trends piece, and then it transitions over to the perspectives and priorities. This is a little bit tighter than the one from the economic development chapter, so I'm trying to respond a bit to um the conversation we had at the last meeting so this is takes a slightly different approach to it um and um so i'm interested to see how your your reaction to this three paragraph section which section which section is this brandon so it's the one entitled the perspectives here. and priorities got it thank you I like to see something put in about the scenic roads, which, well, the basic, basic for that is because of uh, the stone walls and is to preserve stone walls um, and uh, trees, tree lined roads. Maybe that goes in the inventory section. What do you think? They could. You know, yep. but, but that's a sort of, that's the rule, you know, area is uh, a lot of people bike ride, they ride their horses on them and, you know, the whole area that's got that. They can go do a lot of traveling with them. But it's a, it's a, it's a resource to the town. Okay. Another opportunity, that's all. <clears throat> Yeah, I think the scenic byway is referenced, um, but I did. There is not a scenic section sort of in here or a ref discussion in there. And maybe that does fall into the town road section as well. If you understand, it's a it's a, a separate thing. Mm -hmm. for, uh, scenic roads. It's a, yeah, you it's have a, a local. You have locally designated scenic roads. They they were voted on by the town, each road. Right. And uh, that's the, the protection. I think that's a good economic resource that keeps that stone walls and historic history. But that's part of your maintenance to protect them. 
I do get after the <laughs> I do get after the highway department occasionally <laughs> for ditching the side of the road to get too close to the stone wall <laughs> where they fall down. <laughs> but uh they're important. Keep losing them. So anything in response to that perspectives and priorities language? I, I liked the tone of it. Okay. I'm not hearing a lot else. So <laughs> given the- I think it means it's great. I think it comes across fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on from that. Um, I still need to work on this major street plan question. I think this is something, Rob, you and I are going to have to get on and clarify because now I've got notes that are going uh, in two different directions. So I'm not really clear whether you actually do have one that exists or is, and is adopted or not. Um, and, but we can sort that out. A major street plan? I, I didn't know that, Rob. Major street plan. Yeah, I didn't either. Yeah, <coughs> I'm not sure it exists. It might. Yeah, I, I got your more recent note that it did not. The but somewhere in the packet of stuff you guys sent me from the transportation subcommittee, there's something that says it does. So uh, <laughs> we'll have to go back through and rectify these. Two I may, I may have uh, maybe, maybe I said major street when I meant to say complete streets. <laughs> So it's in possible. my mind, there, there's two things. There's the, the Lebanon complete street plan that we may or may not want to link to as a sample, um, mm -hmm. <coughs> but certainly mention the fact that the town, one of the recommendations coming out of here is that we think we need one of those. But the other one is the uh, great street plan out of Burlington that we may yeah. want to link to. So yeah. those are the two options, I think. Okay, neither of those is this thing. So this is a statutory thing that would then give you the um, authority to adopt an official map, and I think also potentially um, other things that follow from that under statute. So I think this is a matter of a basic um, road map slash plan and inventory, which you do have, I understand the inventory part. Uh, but it's a matter of just saying that you're doing it in the plan and adopting it. So I think um, you may have the pieces, but may have never actually done the step of saying that this is what you've got and you're adopting it as a major street plan, which then puts you in a position to do other things statutorily if you do, want to. We do have the scenic road. We have adopted scenic roads. Yep. And so we've identified yep. those. I think Celie was talking about those earlier. That's uh, mm -hmm. uh, basically makes it so that uh, the town adopted the plan, it's complete, I'm sorry, the scenic roads. We've identified them. And anytime a utility wants to do any kind of work, they have to come before the planning board and have a formal hearing outlining what they want to do. We have to advertise it twice in the Valley News. Right. Uh, uh, so that anybody, if they have any objections to what they're talking about doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, it's different from that too. So okay. we'll, we'll we'll talk through that um, <laughs> offline and uh, and get this language sorted up. So um, we also talked a little bit before about the capital improvement program. So that's something where I also need to do some more um, research and and um, see whether you may not be using. It sounds like the the sit the sip for road improvements, but you might have something else mm. that lays out the plan for road improvements going forward. So yep. this is sort of a place to make that tie, that tie in between your capital planning and the comp and the town plan, yeah. master plan. And then we're talking through the regional projects um i pulled these off the new hampshire dot project viewer um as i think there's three or four things here listed um and show up there 
their timing is always somewhat, you know, uncertain. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you have any more updated information about the actual timing of any of these um, projects. And I'm curious what um, what the uh, scope of the of the four Route Four project to from Lebanon to Maple Main intersection actually is. I and mean, none of the documents are up on the website, so it just lists that this is the project. And I know it's also referenced in the corridor plan, but it doesn't particularly say the scope, the full scope of what that project is. Yeah, the, the, the meeting that uh, Rob and I were at, they, they talked about sort of like all of the facts and figures about the problems with that intersection, but I don't think they went into any solutions, did they? There was a there was a state of New Hampshire meeting <coughs> maybe six, eight months ago. And I'll, I can dig that out. I'm sure I've got some documents on that. Randy, I'll send it to you. Mm. There's a there's a section of Route 4 between, say, the Lebanon line and Enfield's Main Street that they had, I think, $15 million specifically uh, uh, worth of projects outlined. That's a pretty tough section of road. It's it's very steep coming in on what we call Dry Bridge Hill. There's no breakdown lanes. Uh, there's some safety issues. It goes right by the village school. Uh, speed change. Uh, drainage issues. And like I said, and it, and it also encompasses that intersection, which they're, they're at least tentatively talking about. Uh, some improvements there. Maybe a traffic circle or a rotary or something like that. Not yeah, the online description basically just says add shoulders and improve the alignment. It doesn't speak to the intersection upgrades. And I, I saw that the the regional planning commission's corridor plan was basically saying that the intersection should be part of that. Yeah. Um, so I was curious to see if that conversation had been started. Um, it may be just something we need to follow up a little bit with through the Regional Planning Commission to get a better sense of exactly where this is and the, the pipeline, if, if engineering really is going to start um, sometime in 2022, then they must have a more complete scope of the project in terms of what, what you know, are they going to look at the, are they going to do something about the, the, in, the intersection or are, is it just the shoulder and alignment part that's currently described. Okay, so we should, this is one we should definitely be following up on because you may want to have something pretty specific in here in terms of what um, what the town would like to see as a to help you bargain <laughs> with the New Hampshire TOT. Yeah. Um, you know, if there hasn't been some sort of major scoping study of the intersection, I, I, I find it unlikely to think that they're going to throw that into a project that theoretically is supposed to start engineering this year coming up. Um, because usually there's a scoping step before they jump to engineering. So. But who knows? And they've got some repaving projects on the list and repairs to the Shaker Bridge. Those are on the longer term list, the 10 year plan list. Um, whereas the Route 4 project is on the, um, what's called the STIP, the Statewide Transportation Improvement Plan. So that is a more like a five year timeline plan. So whatever it is that you want out of these regional projects, this is your place to say yes. that you want you want it <laughs> and uh, to emphasize that. So um, and then the looking ahead to to what you you might see in the future, um, I think we've hit a lot of this discussion already. Uh, these are the topics that sort of rose to my mind um, as being the things that you might want to reference, but you might have some additional things you would like um, added in or some things that might be more specific. Um, 
obviously the intersection one is in here and the parking we just talked about. Um, we talked about transit um, and sidewalks. So obviously these are the the major. I've got one to add, Brandy. Mm -hmm. Electric vehicle charging. That's in the, in there, the recommendations. Right? Oh, sorry. Number it is under the recommendations. Um, I didn't put in an unmet and future needs um, section for that. Um, if you had public parking and were looking to put charging stations into it, I think it might fit in there a little better without having any public parking or much public parking of your own. I don't know whether there's a real um, sort of space for the municipality in some ways in that discussion. I've always thought that the model for that is best to sort of embed the EV charging in the private uh, businesses such as Jake's or one of those so that you have well, yeah. services available for when you're having your car charged. You can go get a cup of coffee or go shopping. You see it in Lebanon, yeah. that's what's happening there. They put the EV charging next to Walmart and Price Chopper. Yeah, but we don't have Walmart and Price Chopper. Well, so Jake's is our best shot. I thought and, and a lot of small businesses, and they're yes. not ever going to be able to host those things themselves. Uh, yeah. I was thinking that across so, is one of your best, right? And people have time, potentially. Yeah, they're going the to be parking there for eight hours. There. The people need to yeah. park there, so you're going to have non EVers parking there. Right. right. Because right now you have people parking there. That, that are parking for the restaurant, but yeah. they're supposed to be parking for the rail ticket. Yeah. 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 So the the EV chargers that are at the grocery store and the um like the Tesla stations outside the price chopper, those are that's a private arrangement between yes. Tesla and Price Chopper actually. <laughs> and is is repeated all over the place. Um and it's really it's the efforts of the car manufacturers to provide um, adequate charging stations. But it's really a short term problem that you would be focusing on here. I mean, as soon as there's a, hmm. a minimum amount of electric vehicles in the fleet uh, out there um, and charging gets down to some reasonable period of time, that's more equivalent to what it takes to fill your tank um, right now with gasoline. They're simply going to go into the gas stations. Yeah, so they are absolutely. It's just going to roll. You know, there's not going to be another thing that's created. It's just going to roll over. So, so really, it's more a matter of municipalities that have sort of public parking spaces have gotten in on that. Um, you know, because there are programs available. To, to participate in, to put in those charging stations through utilities, through businesses, you know, through the car manufacturers themselves and, and things like that. But if you don't really have the public parking component, um, you could speak to the electric charging in your yeah. regulatory context, you know, in terms of including it um, if you were to have some sort of a major development, but once again, you're kind of unlikely to be at that scale where it's something that you would trigger. Um, you know, there are municipalities that are requiring, you know, charging um, capable parking for multi-unit buildings, for instance. So if you're putting in a, a 40 unit apartment building, it's gonna have to come with charging capabilities for the vehicles in the parking area, the garage. But it's really at that scale of development that that sort of thing is happening. It's kind of hard to do it um, at the rural town scale where you're approving one house at a time. What about the community buildings? Like the, the parking spots right next to the road there. I'm just thinking for access or power. Mm -hmm. Just because that's used as a park and ride scenario is really the only public parking you uh, might uh, have. Brandy. But... This is Maynard. I saw I'm an electric vehicle owner for five years now, and I completely agree with what you're saying. 
Uh, there, we're going through some growing pains as we transition away from combustion engines to electric vehicles. And we're getting great messages from Volkswagen and General Motors and Volvo. You know, they're, they're moving their fleets, their, their, their products to electric vehicles. And it really is just a matter of time before that becomes an infrastructure that will eventually replace gasoline, the gasoline networks that are out there. So, it's, yeah. It's and then the, the gas stations are going to, to buy out those private chargers and rip yeah, them up well, so that you have to go to the convenience store while your car is being charged, just like you have to now. <laughs> right. the, the charging times are going to come down. The battery technology is going to change. It, it's going to happen. It's just that we're going through the, the growing pains part of it right now. So I agree. I don't, I don't think it's something that the town needs to worry yeah. so much about providing for it because it might be obsolete by the time they ever got their their act together. So it's easy now if you have public parking to throw in a charge point station or something and that works easy. Yeah. But we don't have the parking. So until we get that. In uh, in my hometown, Plainfield, we, we got we've got one place and it's at the convenience store. The town did help facilitate it through the energy yeah. committee. Uh, they put solar on top of the convenience store. And I think the, the energy committee went after grants that helped them fund it. Right. And so there is that's one the, spot. So that's that's <laughs> Brandy's point in two, three about seek opportunities to partner with organizations or businesses, you know, yeah. to do this. So I think that's the approach that's going to make the most sense. Yeah. It yeah. gives the most flexibility and it allows the greatest adaptation to whatever technology changes uh, proceed from there. I love this Sorry, recommendation yeah, yeah. section, Brandy. I like it mm -hmm. when, you, when you put it in the economic development section, because if this if this master plan is going to be used, and that and this booklet text or whatever sitting on Rob's desk or Jim's desk or the planning board desk, people are going to be opening it up and say, "Well, wait, we're going to talk about transportation. Let's go see what the recommendations were." And they're going to go right to that. They're not going to worry about the inventory section or anything because that's almost historical. They're going to look at this recommend recommendation and say, oh yeah, we addressed this issue when we started talking about the master plan. <clears throat> and if somebody comes to us and says they want to put in parking or they want to put in a development or whatever, we're going to focus on those recommendations. So I really like that in these chapters, the recommendation section. Thank you. And, and, so, and yeah, to, to, to that point, Brandy, um, I've always thought that each chapter is going to be self-contained and it would include the recommendations and it would also include the implementation um, and the accountability section, you know, who's going to do what, when and uh, that that would be part of each chapter rather than having a separate chapter for implementation, which I, I think seems to be the way that you were organizing it. I think it, would it is what time. I was envisioning from the structure is that there would be these individual recommendations in the chapter and then you could organize them from all the chapters together into the implementation yeah. plan. The one benefit of putting them all together is that you can organize them amid, you know, amongst them, the various chapters. So you may want to prioritize them based on timing, or you might want to group them based on sort of who's responsible for them. And for instance, there's likely to be, you know, remember in the economic development chapter, there was a whole bunch that related to the <clears throat> town's zoning um, ordinance. In housing, there's going to be another chunk like that, for instance. We know for sure that's coming. Um, so those can actually be merged together at the point that you get to the implementation chapter. And so you could have a section that's basically, this is you know the, the guidance direction for revision to the zoning, and it comes from multiple chapters. So there's that's what I see as the benefit of putting it together. If you really want them to each be their self own self-contained you know, element, that can be done. I can say from a standpoint of, because um, that's a similar tool that we used for the strategic plan or that they are using for the strategic plan with the school. And it was nice because you did have them all together. And, and like Brandy said, some of them I think it might be what we could do, maybe, I don't know. But 
you could say like this is on the the three the next two to four years and this is on the you know next four to six year plan like you can kind of break it down and then section it and you know we always had kind of the that green yellow red so green was kind of each year when we did our review it was the his this is what's been done these are in process and then this is the stuff that still hasn't been touched yet it just gave that really easy visual and it might be easier to change like for planning board if you guys are going to look at it once or twice a year if you've got something you can easily just edit you don't have to search through the whole thing to get back to you know do we do it do we not do it yeah. I don't know if it's a chapter. I would guess I was just thinking like a matrix type idea or just that. It um, usually is a big matrix, but yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'd be afraid stuff might get I, lost. Can we can we do it both? Can we can we have our implementation strategy in chapters and then one great big matrix at the end? How would that go over? I think you could, yeah. I mean, you could put the strategies in each chapter for how you're going to implement it, right? Or what you're, I'm just thinking too, for the point of editing, if we were going to edit this, it might be easier. I don't know who's in charge of that after it gets handed over to us. But let's say it's the planning board. If you, if you all have to edit it, it's probably less time consuming to do it in as few and just to be consistent in the you know, few places versus trying to make sure. But I think if you mention how things, you know, maybe that's year one, maybe after you've discussed it, once this is final and approved and all that jazz, um, you know, in the planning meeting, maybe that's first part is what you talk about. You go through each chapter, you look at the recommendations, you decide how it's gonna be implemented and that carries over to the matrix section which is you know or, how do we check or maybe it's like a bullet point in the chapter which then links to the appropriate matrix. yeah we could definitely do some links i think if that we're, we're kind of down to a layout and organization question that we can return to once we've we've gotten the content um it's pretty easy to rearrange and restructure so what i think we can put that sort of on the, to think about okay. list as we go forward um, and and see, you know, see how you're feeling about it, whether you do want that individual sort of each, each of these chapters is, is, is self, self-sufficient or, or whether there's going to be more overlap and, and actually how much overlap there ends up being between some of these recommendations may help uh, sort of shape what the most, effective way of doing the implementation is. So that gets us through the, the transportation chapter, but I think we've, we've still got some pieces um, here and I think the goal will be the same and the process will be kind of the same for the economic development group. Um, I'll be continuing to do some work and I'm, I'm hoping the subcommittee goes back in and, and does some more um, work in response as well. And so we'll sort of do another internal loop before you ultimately get a revised version of this uh, back before the whole committee um, for a second review. Okay. Uh, so that, I guess, takes care of all of the uh, master plan stuff. Uh, here's my agenda. Um, we're supposed to do a quick review of the economic development chapter again. Not this evening. Not I have evening. not okay. gotten back around to that, but you will at some point be receiving uh, revised versions thereof. So, okay. so writing a chapter every two weeks is to stay in front of you is, 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 is <laughs> an ongoing challenge. So you may, you may not get second drafts until closer to the end. 
Okay, no, no problem on that. Um, I think I actually may have left that from a previous version of the agenda. Should have deleted it. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about um, having some focus groups. And I thought we'd try to collectively decide on what the goals of the focus groups might be. Yeah, how do they differ from the other focus groups that we've had in the, at the beginning? Which other focus groups? Well, you know where well, the charrettes and the, the, the uh, uh, pieces that the meetings that we had at the Shaker. Okay, well, my thought, and I had uh, wanted to get input from the group, but since you've asked, I'll go first. <laughs> um, my thought is that we take these draft chapters and have focus groups centered around those chapters. Feedback. Yeah. And that would be our, you know, put it out there to a small group. Let's talk about it. What did we get right? What did we get wrong? What are we missing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that that's my concept. But I want to hear from the rest of you folks um, how you might think we would use. Well, in order to make that effective, you really have to get some number of people interested to attend a focus group, right? And I and I think we would yeah. it, based on the um, the things that we had over at the museum. Okay. So maybe we we uh, we, we advertise it on such a night, just like we did with at the museum saying, we're gonna talk about transportation this night, if you're interested in transportation, come give us your feedback, that's a deal. And, and, and we give them our draft plan. Yeah, sure, yeah. Brandy, is this making sense to you as a, as a vehicle for treating this project? Yeah, or? I think this is sort of in line what I with what I thought you were heading towards, which is once you've got a working draft, you would go back out to the community and you were thinking in the form of these focus groups and really focus in on the the recommendation component um, to, to try to get a sense of whether the recommendations are uh, you know broadly publicly supported and what the priorities um, may be to to um, sort of help structure that that imp implementation matrix. So it's still probably something that you'd be looking at doing more after, probably in the after town meeting um, time frame. So, you know, March into April. Mm -hmm. yeah, How do you handle the situation where, because it's going to happen with transportation, where someone is going to indicate that they think that we should be heading in this particular direction, but the survey respondents did not represent that direction. How, how do you handle that situation? Um, well, Brandy, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you give the professionals view first, and uh, if I have something else, mm -hmm. I will, I will well, say. Well, I, I, what my response to that is that each of these sources of information that you've received from the public is a point of information. Um, some of them are, you know, you've, you've heard from in more detail from fewer people in some place, you know, in some formats, you've heard the survey is, is probably less detailed from a broader base of people. But, you know, it's not like any of them represent the full and total picture of what every person in Enfield thinks. And so that's actually the job of you, the committee, to consider everything you've heard and weigh that and figure out what to put forward um, from a policy perspective. Um, and in some cases, there may be legitimate reasons why the municipality may want to set a policy direction that a significant number of people don't agree with. And you know that means that you're setting yourself up as a municipality for needing to continue a public education process. Um, around an issue that's contentious or um, not, you know, that there isn't a clear consensus about in the community, but that, you know, you are going to move forward with in some way. So those are all options on the table to you. But 
it's it's never as simple as you know we've heard from 93 percent of the population and they you know 62 percent of them say <laughs> thank you so i don't have anything to add to what Brandy said what about um you know we talked about kind of what would happen post town meeting we've talked about renters is that something that we try to do before or do we call it's too late to get that feedback and add it in? I mean, I guess what what would we even I, when would I, we try to do that? I would say, you know, definitely before town meeting. And so that we can incorporate the views of renters um, into the document sooner rather than later. I would say we should you know, start planning a door-to-door -door effort or whatever it is that we decide to do yeah. and be able to implement that sometime in the January, February timeframe. You could also be thinking a little bit about the housing chapter. We haven't obviously not gotten to talking about that yet, but that's going to be one of the main areas where getting um, the perspective from renters could be of particular value um and may they may have a different perspective than you know renters may feel exact you know the difference between well renters feel about you know the town's recreational amenities and, and and homeowners is probably not that much different but perspectives on housing supply may be quite different um so that is um you know as you're thinking about that public outreach effort around the housing chapter um trying to figure out how to engage with the more renters would be would be I think most advantageous there so if you want to target that more precisely you could would, would we want to make some changes to the survey uh, which which would emphasize the issues that are important to renters and de-emphasize some of the broader town issues which we perceive that they don't necessarily care about and maybe distribute those door to door in the apartment and multifamily dwelling units and whatever uh, single family units we can identify as rental property. Or do I don't know if you necessarily want to return to the survey. Okay. Um, you know that the housing questions on the survey certainly would have had an op, you know, would have provided renters with an opportunity to to speak to to rental housing, to, um, if they had um, taken it. But I I think that, um, you know, in some ways the survey ship has sailed. Um, you're not necessarily going to go back um, into that uh, in great detail. But think, but knowing about this weakness in terms of who you've heard from in the survey thinking about the next round of public outreach um, and trying to compensate for that known weakness, I guess is, is the, the recommendation I would have. So how exactly should we go about reaching the, the renters in town? Should we, you know, talk to them door to door, invite them to a focus group? The so main street we... is a gold mine of renters so well, so, yeah, just the door to door and yeah, main street too has quite a few yeah um, i think the hard part is that we're not out of COVID either which would be kind of probably the biggest reason we didn't go door to door for all the rest of this so um i wouldn't i would almost say if there is something we can leave on the door in the door but however mm -hmm. um that might be a better option <clears throat> but it's going to have to be worded to draw their attention and also help them understand why it's important i mean okay. we, we need buy-in and they're not going to see this piece of paper and be like oh well that's definitely what i want to do yeah, how's time. that different than the mail i don't know well, we don't know to go to renters right Maybe they when I was it. renting here, I kept my PO box in Etna, so I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, you know, I kept it near where I worked, and I think that that happens frequently. Is that if because of 
when I got out of work and having to hit the post office, it was more convenient for me to just scoot on my lunch break five minutes around the corner than to try to make it to the post office back here. So, I mean, you might, they might not all have it, but they might not. If they don't know how long they're here or, you know, they might say, oh, I will just have something that's close to work for my convenience. And then. But that's a PO box. People, a lot of people still get mail delivered to a mailbox at their house, whether they're renting an apartment, right, they've right. got a mail bank there, or or they have a, a street mailbox. And so we were we, we broadcast the mailings yeah. to patrons, right? And and so it went to so but I think it went so to every perfect. every mailbox in town. Right. That's why I think the wording has to be somehow geared towards their understanding. So if, for example, I sent the survey link to um, two people who live in Keenan, technically, mm -hmm. but are landlords. Mm -hmm. And they didn't understand, even though I tried to explain it, but they didn't understand why they should take it because right. they didn't live in Enfield. Um, and so, you know, like Brandy said, renters, and I will put myself there as a younger renter, where it, the number is more in, you don't, it's what I pay for my rent, but you don't think of yourself as a taxpayer directly. So you're kind of like, yeah, whatever, give the teachers a raise and vote all the yeses because what well, does it really have to do with me? So how do you how do you bring that to their forefront? So like this is this is important. We want to hear from you. This will affect your life here. I, I just uh, I'm not sure of the wording. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't actually have an idea in my head yet. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not. We just brought it up, so I was curious how we would even do it differently or more effectively. Yeah, I think I, I just to second that and to carry on with it. It, it is sort of making making a more of a a direct appeal to renters separately as a category. Um, I think you could get some some people to to participate um, as you're going. Forward, if you if you make it clear that you're inviting them particularly and that it is relevant um, to them, and I think particularly when we get to talking about housing and um, housing costs, um, the vast majority of renters this is a topic of extreme interest to them. So are we decided yeah. on a direct actually we're we're 10 minutes past huh. our pumpkin time. Um, why don't we just kind of leave it where where we are now with some ideas and we can think about them and um, I like the format that we did at the museum. I thought that was nice. I thought that worked out well. We could do the same night four weeks in a row or five weeks in a row or something like that. Yeah. I thought that was you know, worked out well. So we can uh we can discuss that uh at our next meeting, Good. which is on the 10th of January 2022. All right. All right. Anything else from anyone? I'm looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. Maybe oh, seconded. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned at 8.09. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Brandy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. <laughs> Phil, before you go, I just want to say We've been working as a task force for about a year now. And I am just really, really happy with the group, the way it's come together, the way we function, and with the incredible amount of progress that we have made. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys have done a great job. We're doing you well. Know, great job. All right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Yeah. Happy New Year, everybody. See you later. Yep. Bye. Happy New Year. <laughs>